In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It ought to be so simple. Love one another. It's only a three-word commandment. It's not very complex. Why, when love is the one thing each of us wants more than anything else, is it so hard to find? As anyone who has children knows, love is not a limited resource. It isn't like you only have so much of it to give and then you run out. Twenty-four years ago, when my son Marshall was born, I never thought I could love anyone or anything as much as I loved that child. Until three years later, when Eliza was born. Then my love doubled. It wasn't cut in half. Love is an unlimited resource. Why, then, is it often so scarce? From the moment we are born until the moment we die, each of us craves to be loved. We crave it when we're infants, toddlers, and teens, when we're fat and flabby and middle-aged. That's not funny. <laughs> when we're old and doddering, we crave it. At every stage of life, we crave to be valued and appreciated, to be treated with kindness and respect, without strings attached, because that's what love means. We all need love, and we all have love to give. Jesus' command to us ought to be the simplest thing in the world. But it isn't. It isn't because of this little thing we call sin, or human brokenness, or our separation from God. You can call it lots of things. Sin is what warps love, squashes love, makes love seem like a scarce resource. Because of our sin, our brokenness, we love ourselves too much or too little. Because of sin, we love conditionally, with strings attached. I'll love you if you make X amount of money. I'll love you if you get good grades. I'll love you if you can still fit in a size six dress. I'll love you if you do what I tell you to do. Sin warps our love into greed or selfishness or anger. Sin seems so prevalent in genuine love so rare that we believe and unknowingly teach our children that you have to do something in order to be lovable, that you have to deserve love. That is perhaps the greatest sin of all, to teach our children that they have to deserve to be loved. Be successful, then you'll be lovable. Be good-looking, then you'll be lovable. Be powerful or wealthy or smart, then you'll be lovable. But that isn't God talk, that's sin talk. That isn't what Jesus said. If you remember our reading from this morning, then you know there is another little part attached to this simple commandment. Love one another, Jesus said as I have loved you. That means we are supposed to love without conditions, as he taught us in the parable of the prodigal son. That means we are to love in spite of a person's past, as Jesus did when he invited Zacchaeus to dinner, Zacchaeus the tax collector. That means we are to love someone enough to be honest with them, as Jesus was when he spoke to the woman at the well, or when he spoke with the rich young man who wanted to get into heaven. 
That means we are to love enough to forgive as Jesus forgave those who took his life and Peter who denied him three times. That means we are to love sacrificially as Jesus did when he laid down his life for the sake of others. You and I are to love as Jesus loved us because that is how God loves. And this is the love that conquers sin. Let me share with you a couple of memories. A father stands with a mother who lies in a hospital bed holding her newborn daughter. The room is full of flowers. They both look tired but happy. God has just given them the most wonderful gift of their first child. Their lives have been changed forever and they know it. I walk in the room and we visit for a few minutes and they share with me a little bit of the adventure of the birth experience they have just been through. After a few minutes, I ask them if we can pray. They hold hands, the mother's hand resting gently in the father's hand. The infant's hand, so small and fragile, cradled gently on top of both of the other hands. I add my hand to the indescribable beauty of their three hands, and we pray. Joyfully stumbling through inadequate words, trying to thank God for this child, for this family, for this moment, for all that is good and wonderful about life. Here's another memory. Another woman lies in a hospital bed. Her body is full of tubes that deliver medicines that are accomplishing too little too late. Her family gathers in the small cramped room and hover at the foot of her bed. There is silence except for the beeping and the whirring of the machines in the room. I take my little brown box and I place it on the plastic table that bridges the top of her bed. Slowly in the silence, I unpacked little pieces of starched linen, a small brightly polished chalice, and a small silver plate upon which I put tasteless pieces of bread and a little wine mixed with water. Together we say the words that are so familiar yet so strange in that setting. This is my body which is given for you. This is my blood which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And all at once that sterile, small space full of machines and tubes becomes this cathedral as we share in sacrament around her bed. In that moment, there are tears mixed with the bread and the wine, and there is sadness and grief that is laced with hope and even joy. I'm honored to be there, to hold the cup to her lips, to touch her swollen hand, to pray with her, because in that moment, husband and wife and son and daughter are so close together. Death and life are so close together and I'm almost touching eternity. Love is all that matters. Love is all that matters. Love is all that matters. When it comes down to it, everything else is just window dressing. I love you, that new mother said to her new husband, and that new father said to his wife, and that they both said over and over again to that seven-pound pink bundle of joy. I love you, the children whispered to their mother as she slipped from this life into the next. I love you, she said back to them with only her eyes because she could no longer speak. 
We stand today at the heart of all things, the heart of our faith and the heart of life. As a wonderful preacher once said, if you take Christianity and you cook it down to the essence, if you boil away all the peripheral concerns, you find that one thing remains. What remains is not a doctrine, it's not a set of rules, it's not a creed, it's not a confession. You boil the Christian faith down to the essence, and what remains is a face. And it's the face of the absolute, unambiguous love. Our gospel for today cuts through all the trivialities to get at what is so obvious and yet so elusive. Living is about loving, and being a Christian is about loving sacrificially, just as Jesus did. Ubi caritas et amor Deus ibi est, where love and charity are, there God is also. The purpose of life is love. The purpose of life is to love others and to love ourselves. The purpose of life is to give oneself to those around you, to your children, to your spouse, to your friends, to the community, to the hungry, to the poor and the lost. It is so simple, and yet we don't get it. The meaning of life is not found in taking. The meaning of life is found in giving. So if you want love, then give it. If you want friendship, then give it. If you want security and health and wholeness, then work to make others secure and healthy and whole. It may not be easy, but it's clear. We can't say we didn't know. Jesus told us over and over and over again through his words and through his life and through his death. Love one another as I have loved you. It's only a commandment, but it is enough to fill a lifetime. Amen.